we're almost finished with 2018, aren't we? It's getting close. And we're getting ready to enter. 2019 will be the beginning of a new decade for the church. We just celebrated 60 year anniversary. That's six decades. A decade is 10 years. Now we're going into a seventh decade. I believe that God speaks to us through numbers. And I believe that God has a great plan for United Bethel and for Manila for this coming decade. I believe Jesus will return soon. He may come before the end of this coming decade. But I believe God has a great harvest planned. I believe we're going to see a great harvest of souls. By faith, we believe God to save the lost. January, February, we're getting ready for a Billy Graham crusade. They're not calling it a crusade, but it's a crusade. And we are praying. There are 5,000 evangelical churches in Manila that are cooperating and praying that there be a great harvest of souls. Billy Graham meetings start right after Valentine's Day, February 15, 16, 17. Some of you have been praying. You've got one of those uh, Operation Andrew brochures, but you don't have one. You're sent out in the, in the lobby, and you can put names of people you're praying for. You want to see your family and your friends get born again. We support and throw in all of our backing and prayers for this Billy Graham crusade in February. And we're looking at Manila, who has so many people born again. Amen. Now, <clears throat> I've said that to, as part of an introduction, I'm leading into something. I'm going to begin this morning speaking to you about faith. I plan a series in January on the topic of faith. I will point your attention to Hebrews chapter 11, which is called the chapter for the heroes of the faith. Verse 1 says, Now faith is. You heard about the little boy. Teacher asked him, What is faith? And the boy said, Faith is believing in nothing. Well, faith is something. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is something. I'll be talking about it, but I want to tell you faith is like a muscle. You have muscles, you don't use them, they shrink. You use the muscles and they will grow. And faith will grow as you use it. And so faith is something. It is substance. People who believe in God, who trust His promises, See things happen. See things materialize. Faith becomes something you can see. You can test it. You can weigh it. You can analyze it. Faith is something. And when it says that it's evidence, Sister Linda and I bought a piece of land one time. Well, more than once, actually. And uh, we own of land. This is hills and rocks in South Missouri. Uh, how do we know it's ours? Well, we've got a deed that describes the land, gives our name and stuff. It says that we own that. I have substance 
prove that we own that piece of land. Well, if you have faith in God, there will be substance that you can prove that God is real and that He answers prayer. Hebrews 11, 6 says, He that comes to God must believe that He is. In other words, that He exists and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now, people who turn their back who don't seek God, they don't see the wonderful things that God does by God because we have faith in Him. Paul said in Romans 10, chapter, verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. We hear something that makes our faith grow. Father God, will do work in you. He will speak to you to make you grow. Something I've been praying for since I was an early Christian. I pray, Father, make my faith grow. I want to grow in faith. I'm not trying to be a hero of the faith. I don't care if I'm not listed anywhere. But I want faith. I want to know that I can pray I can take the promises of God before him and he'll answer prayer because God exists and he rewards those who seek him. Amen. As I'm talking about faith for the next few weeks, I'm praying for you. I'm not saying you have little faith. I know some of you have great faith, but your faith can grow. You can grow in faith. You just think about that for yourself. You can grow in your faith in God. And so I'm praying for you that you will grow. That something will happen in this time. We're talking about this. And you're going to just, uh, suddenly it's, the lights are going to be turned on. And you're going to say, you know what? I can believe God for things. John said, he started his book, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That word is a capitalized letter because it's a name. It's a name given to Jesus Christ. He is called the Word of God. He is called in Greek, uh, Logos. That's his name. And the Bible people were named. The name had significance. The name spoke of their character. Jacob was not straight. And so he was given the name Jacob, which means the usurper, the, the cheater. I don't like to have a name like that. Well, I, I sure hope that uh, you don't have names. I've heard fathers call their kids stupid. I was praying with a young man in an altar in a church in Hong Kong years ago. His father kept telling him, you're stupid. That's not what you want to call your kids. You're smart. You got brains. You can solve, you can, you can conquer mathematics and science and history. You got a good brain, you can do that. Amen. Don't call him a But Jacob was called the cheater. God changed his name later. He got called Israel. <clears throat> but the name means something. And so when we speak the name word, we're speaking about Jesus. The truth comes from Father God is revealed in a person, Jesus Christ. Your faith can grow if you know and associate and talk to and walk with and love Jesus Christ. Outside of that, faith doesn't grow. Even miracles do not make people grow in faith. Only Jesus. Now, I'm saying this because I want you to know we expect miracles in the church. We have some miracles take place right here in this altar. Healing miracles. Amen. We've had God provision miracles. We're sitting in a miracle this morning. 
Amen. I know that I knew a person incurable disease, dying, and God healed him. He later turned his back on Jesus. He died and he did not go to heaven because even though he had a miracle, he still didn't continue to walk with Jesus. Now some people have asked me, and actually I've, I've toyed with this question for years, why is it that God heals some people and then other people that don't get healed? You ever ask that question? You should. I'm not sure I can give up you know, a, a total clear answer on that, but I do know that God knows the future and you, you can just kind of think like, God, why would God heal that person if in the future they're going to turn their back on God and do some horrible things? Well, <clears throat> I don't preach eternal security. I preach eternal security as long as you believe in Jesus. As long as you're trusting Him, walking with Him, you've got eternal security. They won't kick you out of heaven. You're saved. As long as you walk in faith in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to keep preaching that one. I'm not going to shut up. We've had people stand in this pulpit and preach eternal security. So once you say they're always saved, I don't believe that. Miracles are wonderful, but I can tell you when you trust in Jesus, miracles are sort of secondary. They just sort of come along. If you're trusting in Jesus, your faith will grow. Walk with Jesus. I fell in love with Jesus when I was a young man. I want to walk with Him. Every day I want to talk with Him and be with Him. I grow in my love for Him because I walk with Jesus. Consequently, my faith grows at the same time. So, first principle I'm going to lay in this foundation of this lesson is Faith grows out of your relationship with Jesus. Amen. Well, Brother Aaron, uh, that's good. To know. I like to hear that. I looked at the book of Acts the other day. I was sitting in my office and I went through the first ten chapters of the book of Acts. You remember Jesus? Crucified, certified dead, buried in a sealed tomb, rose from the dead, spent 40 days with his disciples. Upwards to 500 people saw him alive after his resurrection. Those people heard Jesus say, wait in Jerusalem until you are in Doomed with power from on high, the promise of the Father. So they waited in Jerusalem. They knew Jesus. They knew his teachings. But they had to wait. They waited for the promise of the Father to be fulfilled. You should seek that same promise to be fulfilled in your life. It's the coming of the Holy Spirit. And those people on the day of Pentecost, about 120 of them, the Holy Spirit came and they were baptized in the Spirit. Flames of fire set on their head and they spoke languages they had not learned before. They spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. That was God's power put into the church. The believers of Jesus Christ, He empowered them. In the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost was a powerful day. Those people stood up and preached on the street. 3,000 souls were born again on the day of Pentecost, according to the historic record. A little while later, 
Peter and John were going up to the temple. Time of prayer. There was a beggar had been begging for years, crippled man. And when they looked at him and he looked at Peter said, I don't have any silver and gold to give you, but I do have something to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. That beggar jumped up. And they're in the temple where you're supposed to be solemn and quiet. He's dancing. He's shouting. He's praising the Lord because a miracle came from Jesus into his life. After that, the authorities, that's the religious leaders, called the disciples, the apostles in, said you can't speak anymore in this name. You stop preaching Jesus. Well, they went back to the house where there was a prayer meeting and the people started to pray. And this is weeks perhaps after Pentecost, but when the people prayed, the Holy Spirit came down. The place was shaken because of the presence of Jesus through His Spirit. The church was so powerful, two hypocrites tried to lie in the altar and God struck them down. And there have been people for centuries saying, Oh God, don't do that again. Peter and John, the disciples were in jail. An angel came, broke the day jail locks, and they were set free. That's power, brothers and sisters. Amen. Angels opened the jail. They chose seven deacons. Acts chapter 6. Stephen and Philip were deacons among the seven. Stephen preached so powerful that the rulers of the religious Jewish people were so angry and so disturbed they were grinding their teeth and they were cursing this preacher uh, as Stephen preached and they finally stoned him to death but there was a powerful witness another deacon <laughs> some of you deacons are just what I would have like some like I'm pull on you Philip he couldn't just deke he had to preach. And that deacon went over to Samaria, kind of off grounds for Jews, and he started preaching, and the whole city accepted Jesus Christ. And while he's there in the middle of that great awakening, the Holy Spirit picked him up, took him down to the road to Gaza, Ted joined that chariot over there, and so Philip started jogging till he caught up with the chariot. Inside that chariot was a diplomat from Ethiopia, actually the treasurer of the government. And he was reading, and Philip led him to Jesus. He accepted Jesus, saw some water. He said, what's to keep me from being baptized? While he was baptized in water, came up dripping wet, the Holy Spirit snatched Philip out of the water, took him 39 miles to another city where he was preaching again. I do plan to talk to Philip when I get to heaven because I want to know what that was like. Now, I've flown a lot of different kinds of airplanes and helicopters. Vietnam, I traveled around in a helicopter. And I know what it is, it, you know, a couple of hundred feet in the helicopter points forward a little bit and starts moving up to 90, 100 miles an hour. I've ridden on helicopters when there was danger from rockets and the chopper pilots would get as close to tree level as they could get. You could see those runners out there hoping they don't catch on the branch of the tree and pull us down out of the sky. But I can, can hardly imagine in the baptismal tank taking somebody, dipping them in the water, and then whoosh, 39 miles. What an experience. You see, Pastor, do you believe that? I do. 
I believe the Word. I believe it from cover to cover. I believe it is the absolute, authentic, unalterable Word of God. Old Testament, New Testament, I believe it. Amen. You have to believe, brothers and sisters. You want your faith to grow, then then start just by believing the simple things. Jesus came. This is what we're celebrating, the coming of Jesus. God came down, became a man through the natural human process, and he lived a sinless life. He preached good news from heaven. Hallelujah. And after he was finished, his time was up, they crucified him. He shed his perfect, pure blood to wash away your sins. They buried him. He was certified dead by Roman executioners. They buried him. He was dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He was seen by the disciples. He was seen, he was seen by people over there. Up to 500 people saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. I believe in him. I trust him. Hallelujah. He keeps his word. Those disciples, after Stephen was stoned and Philip was flown, then we have demons cast out. The church grew. First number was 3,000. On the day of Pentecost, next number is 5,000 people. Then later on, they said many priests, that means rabbis, had become believers in Jesus. The church was growing. They didn't have mega church growth principles. They didn't have seminars to teach you how to make the church grow. You can get a hold of certain laws. You can make anything grow. You can make your business grow if you get a hold of the right kind of business laws. Uh, the things that affect the growth of business, you can make your business grow. But it's not that which makes the church grow. The church grows because of people walking with Jesus. People who know Jesus. People through whom God can demonstrate His power, release His power in the world. Last miracle that I'll talk about in the book of Acts, there's this little guy with eye trouble, hated Christians, riding a horse to the city of Damascus. He had papers in his pocket. He could put Christians in jail. And God struck him off of that horse, found himself laying on his back on the road to Damascus, and a voice spoke to him. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. His life was so thoroughly changed. Mighty impact he made when he preached the gospel. He was a missionary. Paul was an apostle, but he was a great man. He wrote over half the books in the New Testament. Powerful man. Influenced so many people. He's still influencing people today. So, Jesus said to his disciples, John 7, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Let me talk about rivers for a little bit. Revelation chapter 22. Last book in the New Testament. Last book in the Bible. Last chapter. We see a picture John saw of heaven. And there was a river flowing from the throne, from God. Flowing down. And there was something about that river he said that as it flowed, it got deeper water, deep enough to swim in. And then the scripture says there were fruit, there were trees growing by the river. And there was fruit every month. Those trees produced fruit. Now what tree, fruit tree do we know of today that could do something like that? That, those trees, those fruit trees were getting water, the living water coming from that river. Now, you know that our body is a product of what we eat and drink. Yeah, I'm 
We try to teach our kids that. And they reach for sugar, candy, love bananas uh, with uh, sugar on it. What do they call them? I told my son one day, I said, you know, uh, your body is a product of what you eat. Junk food, junk body. Anyway, I know I'm not really smart, but uh, there's truth in that. Those trees by that river are getting water. That's powerful. Our scientists and our nutritionists, they think that ancient foods had more energy, more nutrients, were better than the foods we have today. That's a basic theory most of us pretty much agree with. Well, if God created something and in its original form, which I see that river, Revelation 22, flowing from the throne of God, that's water. Now Jesus said, I can give you water, sent to this American woman, if you knew who you're talking to. And if you ask him, he can give you water. You'll never thirst again. That's water. Well, I've been drinking that water. <laughs> and some of you are too. I know it. You drink that water and you get something from God every day. He pours into you new energy and new strength and healing. Scripture says the fruit of those trees is for the healing of the nations. Wow. You get to heaven, you won't be sick. No more sickness. Say amen to that. Now I'm hoping, let's see, <clears throat> when I was about 19, my Bible school sent me to Nicaragua to help build a church, Central America. I learned Spanish, so. We were building the church and there was this huge mango tree on the property and the mangoes were in season. And we'd be working away and we'd hear when the mango would break loose and fall down through the leaves of that tree. We could hear it coming down. And if we were fast and picked up those mangoes that fell, we had delicious mangoes before it worms for the pigs to get there. Yeah, the pigs, they're hanging out on the red mango trees. I was a big pig because I ate some mangoes that summer. I'd never had them before in my life. I fell in love with mangoes, and I'm hoping that one of those 12 kinds of fruit that's on beside the river, that there's mangoes. And if you get to heaven and you want to look for me, I'd probably be sitting over there on the bank of that river under the mango tree. Amen. Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, Jesus said, whoever drinks this water that I give him will never thirst. I'm praying for you to grow in faith, walk so close to Jesus, you know what that means. You won't be thirsty for things of the world, or for things you don't need, or things you shouldn't be touching. But you'll be thirsty for Jesus. Amen. Looking for Jesus to satisfy the deep needs in your life. Let's bow our hands for prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Since your presence, the oh Lord speak to us today. I pray that you make our faith grow because of your presence. I pray that you raise up giants of the faith. I know, Lord, you spoke to me before I first sat with our deacons that you're going to raise up giants of the faith in our deacon board. I believe you. I'll put the need to get on the spot this morning, but I believe you, Lord, that there could be leaders in this church who are giants in faith. We love you, Jesus. Amen.
man. 